That's all you got to do. Even if your projects suck, it does not matter. Just do a project. It doesn't have to be this whole thought-provoking thing. It doesn't have to actually solve the world's problems. It doesn't have to do any of that stuff. But you need to apply something. If you're bad at interviewing, go out and interview people. Please. What up, unicorns? Eric Abram here, and I'm back. I'm back with another Ugly Unicorns podcast. Look, guys, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I I apologize. It's been a hot minute since I did a podcast. I would probably say it's been about about two, three weeks. What do you, what do you guys think? About three weeks. I know. I'm sorry, guys. It's it's been it's been crazy to say the least. It's been crazy. There's a lot that's been going on. There's a lot of things I want to tell you. There's a lot of things that I can't tell you right now, but I can tell you later. There's a lot of things I want to do for you regarding interviewing and, and uh, whiteboard challenges and, and other UX things. But uh, just to get into it, man, um, you know, I haven't really been posting a podcast. And um, it's it's been because, you know, it's been a lot of things going on with me. Um, if you guys don't know, um, you know, let's just take it back. <laughs> let's go back, back. Okay, so the for, so for the first time, uh, the reason why I didn't post because you know I went to uh, wrestling jujitsu practice um, a couple Sundays ago, and I thought I broke my ribs. No, I didn't break them. One of my training partners did a a blast double. Right, it's where you like basically full force head into the sternum, cup the legs, and you drive through. Right. And so he goes to do that, and uh, there's a crash pad behind us and everything. So you can, like, oh, just go as hard as you want. And so he goes to do that, and he doesn't go full into the sternum, as you can see here, as I'm touching my shirt. He goes off to the left and kind of hits some of those ribby ribs. The ribby ribs. <laughs> he hits the ribby ribs, and I feel a little crack. And so I go down. And everybody's like, good job, Jay. Good job. I'm, like, I'm over there like, oh, ah, oh, my ribs. I can't breathe. Uh, uh. And people thought I was joking. And everybody's like right laughing. And like I'm on the ground for like another couple, like a two minutes. And they're like, oh, shit, Eric is actually hurt. And so like I literally just slide off the mat like that to the side. They're trying to, they're trying to lift me up. I just basically like do like a barrel roll off the mat. <laughs> it looked like a slug or something or a worm. And I just slowly get up, and uh, one of my other training partners is like, hey, breathe through your nose. You don't know, so, just, so you can like fill your lungs up fully. So I'm doing that and going, <sighs> I'm breathing it in, and my lung, my ribs are hurting. So I'm like, damn, why are these things hurt? And But like, they weren't hurting that bad, right? Because the adrenaline rush was there, you know, we're training, and I'm, and I'm warm. But it wasn't until that night that I go home, and I start to try to go to sleep. If you guys ever had like a bruised rib or a broken rib or anything happening to your ribs, you know that sleeping is going to be a struggle bus. Struggle bus, toot toot, get on the bus. No, you ain't sleeping tonight. I did not sleep that night because I was in so much pain. I took ibuprofen, did not work. I'm just like, oh my God, I actually think I have broken ribs. And so... <laughs> Literally in the middle of the night while I couldn't sleep, I made an appointment for that morning, uh, the next morning to go into the, to, to see the doctor and get x-rayed. And so I go to the doctor. Uh, they sit me down, ask me all these questions, ask me what happened. They're like, you do what? I was like, yeah, I do jujitsu and wrestling. They're like, okay, okay, well, that makes sense. What will happen? So they took me in the x-ray room, doing all these like weird positions and all this stuff, like I was in a dance dance video, I'm like, hey, hey, it was just so strange, and like I had to do this one move, I had to go like this and put my chest up to the to the thing, to the plate, and I swear to God, I was like, oh my God, I think something's about to pop right now. And so they took, so they took the x-rays, and um, I just wanted to say, because of COVID, that process took about two hours. Why? Because we had to like, once I made the appointment, right, 
I make the appointment. I drive to the thing. It says when I get to the door, it says you have to like text your text text this phone number with whatever details. So okay, I'm like that's weird. Text this number. You send a text. You wait a while. They send you another text with a link, a link for you to like log in and do some other shit. I'm like, but I already made the appointment. Like, why am I doing all these extra steps to get into the thing if I already made all these appointments? And that, and I have to like sit in my car, like literally two hours. My wife drove me because it, driving was very difficult at the time. I couldn't really do a lot of turning with with my dominant uh, driving arm. And so the process took about two hours and I made an appointment. Shit. Like that, I'm glad I didn't have like a life injuring injury, but like it, it was just, it was just a struggle bus. Like we need to figure out a better system we need a UX, we need a user experience this system to make this process a little bit more smooth because that was kind of ridiculous how long I had to wait. And then um, so I get in, I go talk to the lady, take my x-rays, and she tells me, like, hey, uh, we don't really have the uh, actual specialist on on staff today. We're gonna send us out to another person, they can kind of look at your x-rays. So they did that. They called me back and said, hey, nothing's broken. You might have some bruised ribs. You are worried about like with like your spleen and stuff like that. So we just wanted to monitor, make sure you don't do any more jujitsu for a while. So I had to take off two weeks for jujitsu. And um, in that two weeks, man, I, would, I really felt like, like I was missing something. I felt like unmotivated, felt really kind of bogged down. Like a lot of things in my life were just like, I don't know. It just felt it just felt very strange, and I realized like I really need jujitsu in my life. It keeps me. It kind of keeps me level because you get you get into the rat races of only doing work, of only doing all this other stuff. You can kind of get a little a little sidetrack and a little down. And so, um, within that two weeks, you know, I also was um, you know interviewing for jobs and stuff because. And that's that's one thing that's different. I actually got a new job. Hooray! Uh, I won't tell you any details right now, but maybe later I will. Uh, yeah, I actually got a new job, and I'm very excited about this new opportunity that I have. A uh, great segue, right? Not really, but whatever. It, this could be a random podcast today. And um, so I got a new job, and um, it's full it's full time remote, and it's with a startup. And so I'm very excited. I'm going to be their senior product designer. Did I even say that right? Senior product designer. And I'm very excited about that. And I got a whole, I got a whole new standing desk set up. The whole office has changed. Like I said in that one video before, uh, they sent me, um, I think they sent me all of my gear. I got my computer, my docking station, um, keyboard, trackpad, and all the other good stuff. I actually got another screen to Matt that that's exactly the same screen so I can have dual screen monitors. So we're going to do a whole setup with that. I'm going to try to film that just like start to finish, like the, how, how the office is being arranged now, maybe do like a couple of time lapses and stuff like that. So you guys can see uh, the whole setup, with the standing desk and everything like that. And p- pretty much all this stuff over here is uh, probably going to go off the wall. Like I got to, I got to figure something out. You guys, did you guys notice my, my dope nunchucks in the back? <laughs> yeah. I got those a uh, couple of weeks ago too. Uh, that's, I, I just always want to talk about my nunchucks because when I was a kid, my favorite character was Michelangelo. Not Michelangelo, Michelangelo for all those art majors out there. <laughs> Michelangelo, the turtle, the ninja turtle. Yeah, man. So uh, also, man, I forgot to ask you guys, how, how, was your, how was your week? How was your weeks? Plural, because I haven't talked to you guys in a minute. Let me know in the comments below. Let me know how your, week, your weeks or weeks were. And uh, I got a lot of things to talk about in this podcast. I just, I guess, I, I'm trying to figure it all out. It's, I'm going crazy. But anyways, um, get back to my normal life type of stuff. So I talked about the job and everything like that. But uh, so speaking of jujitsu uh, that I alluded to, uh, we went to, I went to a, a Grappling Industries uh, jujitsu competition and a couple of our um, guys, and there was no girls competing that day. I think they were all hurt or something like that. I think somebody had a rib injury or think somebody actually got sick or whatever but anyway it's supposed to be like 10 people going i think we had six or seven i believe i don't know five or six or seven 
Anyways, um, it was pretty cool, man. It was actually on this like indoor soccer field type of deal, like this rubber stuff. And <laughs> it's so gross, man. Like people walk around barefoot on that thing and like they get on the mat and all the like black rubber parts would get on the mat too. And the whole mat, the white, it was like white and orange mats. And the white part was just covered in like soot, this like gray thing. <laughs> it was so gross. And one of my training partners, like two of them had on white rash guards because they were doing no gi. And you could just see the dirt on the rash. I was like, yeah, guys, yo, this is a gray rash guard. It was white. <laughs> Anyways, I digress on that. But anyway, uh, everybody did really well, man. We got um, a couple first place, second place, and some couple third places. Uh, I think the guys did really well. They fought really hard. You know, some of some I think some of them was like their first competition ever, and he still did pretty good. Um, you know, some people were let down, like, oh, I didn't get first or second place, whatever. But look, like, look, I'm still proud of you guys, no matter what. You guys fought hard. You guys fought tough opponents. You know, sometimes you don't have to always get the victory. Sometimes the victory is just even being out there because guess what? Ninety nine percent of the population is not doing what you do. So just think about that. Like you have the mental mindset to go out there, put your health on the line, literally, and go out there and compete and do something. And a lot of people are not doing that. Most people are just spectators. And some people, most of people aren't even spectators. Some people don't even know how to actually defend themselves or, or fight or whatever. And you have that leg up. So just remember that. Just remember that when you get down like, oh, only got third place. Like, hey, I got third place too, bruh. It don't matter. It's okay. We're not out here to do that. And for me, I'm not out here trying to win competitions anyway. I got into jiu-jitsu because, you know, I wanted to, you know, have more confidence within myself and, you know, defend myself and my family. So that at that time it ever came, I'll be able to hold my own. And I feel very confident right now about that. I've been training for almost five years and I feel like I could take on anyone who's not a black belt. <laughs> just saying, anyone who's not a black belt. I just want to put that out there. But yeah, that was, that was pretty cool, man. Uh, we had a really good time. Everybody's laughing and giggling. I've seen some old training partners for some old schools that I went to. Shout out to those guys and gals out there. I really miss you guys. I'm going to try to come cross train with you all. To see what you guys are up to. I know a lot of people upgraded their belt status and their ranking. Everybody's getting better. So I want to just see how everybody's doing. And so I might go to a couple other gyms and just cross train, you know, if they allow me to. Um, whatever protocols I'd have to do. Uh, because of COVID, I will do to make sure that can actually happen. But, um, yeah, guys, a lot of things going on. And um, you guys, if you guys haven't no noticed or known already, you know, I created the Ugly Unicorns community for UX designers and other designers out there who want to, you know, help each other out. You know, if rather that's seeking advice from each other or helping each other out, do portfolio reviews or posting jobs and stuff like that. And so, um, you know, I wanted to reach out to my community uh, because we have a few folks in there now. It's, it's, it's slowly growing. We got about 20 people in there right now. We're trying to get more. I think I might cap it about 50 people. I might just cap it. I don't want to have too, too many people in the chat. Um, it's not high activity, but I don't want to get to a point to where it's, it's so many people in there. And for all chatting, you're, like, you're going to miss a lot of things within that scroll, right? Because you know how Slack is. Sometimes you can dismiss a lot of things so i just cap it at that so if you haven't already make sure you go to uglyunicorns.com click on join slack fill out the form and i'll review it and i'll let you in um got a lot of newbies in here We're looking for some more um seasoned individuals like myself and others to join to help out these other young um designers these other fresh UXers in the chat so make sure you go do that uh just a little plug there so i can just get that out the way you know, but anyway, so um, I reached out to the community and I said, hey, you know, what is something that you guys want to see? Because, you know, I've, I've been very busy trying to come up with things. And I just want to know, like, what do you guys want to, you know, know more about or hear about within the podcast? And like, what, what sort of topic would you guys be interested in? And so they put a couple a couple um, suggestions out there. And so this one right here really hit home with me because like this goes into kind of how I feel. It's like how to stay motivated as a UX designer. And I had to think about that one for a minute. I'm like, how to stay motivated? What does that, what is, what does that mean? What does motivation mean? Is it motivated to, 
you like go to work? Is it motivated to actually get into the craft? Or like, are you a new UX designer? And like, you try to stay motivated because you're applying for jobs, you keep getting rejected. Like, in what context would that be? And that context could be different for a lot of people, like the things I just explained. But for me, I think, you know, staying motivated as a UX as a UX designer is just staying motivated and not getting, you know, I guess, uh, burnt out or bogged down or or feeling like you you're you're not good enough or whatever. And so I just wanted to just try to translate it into that into to my perspective of trying to stay motivated. And it's from a from a point where I was coming up through the ranks as well, just from my own point of view, is and it's me currently. And so for me to stay motivated as a person who was, you know, fresh into the UX to UX field, coming off being just a graphic designer, I think what really motivated me, what really motivated me was uh, trying to get something, right? That that goal to reach to get that job. And I think I it was like it's like it's like jobs to be done. Like jobs to be done was for me was get UX job. And everything in between that was what I was trying to do to to achieve that goal. And so how I stayed motivated was I was like, I would, I would, you know, hit people up, talk to them, you know, know more about their story and their journeys. And that kind of motivated me and like, oh man, if that person can do it. I can do it. You know, going to different meetups and listening to different people's perspectives on user experience and, you know, you know, getting their expertise on particular topics and just making those relationships and building those relationships really, really helps you out. And also having a partner that you could talk to. Because, like, when I was coming up through the trying, trying to figure out this whole UX thing, like, I always had someone I could, like, chat with, like, talk UX with. Now that's my wife now because she knows about user experience. But before that was <clears throat> where, like, people I met in the meetups groups, you know, get on a phone call. I still talk to these people to this day, a couple years later, chit-chatting what you guys are up to, what you guys are doing, what you're working on, et cetera, et cetera. And just keeping each other accountable, man, keeping each other you know, we send each other links and stuff like, hey, here, check out this event or go check out this book, et cetera, et cetera. And I think those things really help, you know, excite me even more because the more and more and more I learn about user experience, the more excited I get because now I have a now I have more tools to bring to the team. Now I have more motivation and confidence to bring to the team and it helps myself. And so that's kind of what I did as as a young person. And also you can't only just do just user experience at the end of the day. I would say like to help you get through, let's say, let's say you're like applying for jobs and you keep getting rejected and you feeling like you're not worthy or whatever the hell, like go get a hobby. Like at the end of the day, man, like you need something to level you out because if you're always you know, doing learning user experience, doing doing user user experience, applying for jobs, and then you keep getting knocked down every time you apply for a job, and you you know you get a job interview, you get an interview, and it's an HR interview, and they come back and say like, hey, we don't really want you, and then like that just a spiral. So like, I would say find something where you can like do something that's not related to what you were trying to do or not related to that field. Like for me, I do uh, jujitsu or I like to go cycling or I like to go to Orange Theory with my wife or even even the YouTube. Even though YouTube is the YouTube channel is sort of related to that, I even sometimes struggle with doing the YouTube channel because it is related to user experience. And I find myself not wanting to do it sometimes. I think that's kind of one reason why I held off doing the podcast so much because like, it was related to user experience, and that's the reason why I changed the name from UX Unicorns to Ugly Unicorns, because now I'm able to talk about whatever the hell I want. I don't have to just super, you know, drive deep into this whole user experience thing. Like, I just talked about jujitsu, like, just, like, 10 minutes ago, and it's fine because this is my podcast, and I could do those things because those are the things I'm interested in, and I think that right there really helped me um, stay motivated into doing the podcast now because before I was just like, I don't want to do this podcast anymore. I don't even think I like it. But at the same time, now that I changed the format, we've increased our subscriber base by 200 people. 
which is insane. And I get, and what really helps me stay motivated as well is just, you know, those, that constant feedback that you guys give me, good or bad, it doesn't matter. And, you know, you guys hit me up on LinkedIn. It's like, hey, man, I found your video on YouTube. You know, I want to connect with you. You really inspired me. Like that shit right there definitely keeps motivating me. And that's what drove me to create this community because I'm like, all right, if you guys are constantly reaching out to me, you know, via these third other parties, you know, chats, whatever, you can reach me directly within my own community that I created plus others. So therefore, now your questions can be not only seen by me, but seeing somebody else who might even know more than me, because at the end of the day, I don't know everything and I don't claim to know everything. bruh, And I don't want to know everything because I don't want to be that particular smart ass in the room. I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I want to be the person in the room who's learning at the end of the day. I want to observe. Excuse me, <laughs> girls. I want to observe, learn and apply. And that's and that's kind of my motivation. And so. Trying to stay motivated as a UX designer, I guess, as a person now who's actually in the career field, you know, um, you know, I think what really probably discourages some is like, you know, you always hear about imposter syndrome. It's not I don't think it's imposter syndrome. I just think it's like, hey, yo, how did I get here? You know what I'm saying? It's like I wouldn't say like I'm an imposter. Like, I don't think I can. Like, I'm not like, oh, I'm a fucking Data scientists trying to do, you know, graphic design. I'm not like, that isn't even a good example. But I don't feel like I'm an imposter. I just feel like I need to level up and learn more. Because I I know enough to do what I can do. But how do I learn enough to like where I can like apply those particular new sets of skills with the business, with my team to help to help and able to make an impact? And how do I like learn enough skills to like level up and become, you know, a junior, a mid, a senior director, principal designer? I think that's what it is. I don't I really don't like the term imposter syndrome. I just look at it as people who are they're not secure in their abilities right at the current moment. And so they just need a little bit, a little bit more fostering. Maybe you need to read a little bit more books, read them like do some, listen to no more podcasts or whatever, and just get more confidence. I think imposter syndrome just equals lack of confidence. If you have confidence in something, how are you an imposter? I don't, I don't, if you're doing the actual work and you got hired to do the job, how are you an imposter? They definitely believed in you. They hired you for a reason. The only reason why you would feel like an imposter, unless you like lied on your resume. Are you lying on your resume? Are you lying about your skills? Are you lying about what you can actually do? That's the only way you would feel like an imposter because you weren't being truthful. But if you're being truthful about what you did, what you've done, what you what you know, and then all you just need now is somebody just to give you a little confidence. And then I think that's very important as when somebody goes into a new job, they don't like myself. And like previous before, being able to go into a new job and get those quick wins to instill confidence in that new person is very, very important. Very important. Like literally let them get handle that low hanging fruit. They can establish confidence. Maybe you play to their strengths immediately. If somebody can come in, for example, like myself, come into a job and you know you have really great visual skills like Yo, I'll handle that visual skill stuff because that's a quick win for me. I can do it. And that's going to like instill confidence in me knowing that I can do jobs, right? And then that person, let's say you go, let's say the next level is like, are you have a you have a skill set in this but you haven't really done it that much, right? So, what we'll do is we'll partner you with someone. We'll let you do that particular thing. We'll, we'll coach you up a little get a little bit. But we have to know we know at the end of the day that you are capable of doing it. You just haven't done it enough times to have a, like a repetitive like process. And so those can be those all the, those can also be kind of like quick wins. But also you feel like you're contributing a little bit more to the team because you're not only doing the thing that you're able to do really well. You're now you're being challenged just a little bit more. And when you get challenged just a little bit more, you feel a little bit more confident now because you feel like. You found a new set of skills that you can p- apply and bring to the team. 
And that's what Primerica provided for me. And then I feel like the next stage is something where like, let's say you have not done this particular thing before. And so what we need to do is we need to partner you with somebody who has done these things and let them show you a few times, let you do it a few times, let you fail a few times, right? Keyword on the word fail, allowing people to fail so they can figure out that process. And then once you get comfortable enough that you've done a few of these things and you, you know, you've presented, you've, you've interviewed, you've done all the things that you haven't really done before, now you feel even more confident because now you develop another set of skills that you can use to help the team. I think that's what it should be about is helping the, it's building people up, like building a foundation, like building a house, like brick by brick. You know, you can't go into a job expecting to have the full house built. You just can't because, you know, because some neighborhoods or some places have different types of houses. And I'm talking about, when I say neighborhoods and places, I'm talking about actual like companies. So if you go into a particular company where you've built your foundation, you built your house in Florida, let's say, and you go to like the Northwest or Northeast, your house will not suit the environment because it's not weather resistant. It's not fit for the cold environment. I say cold environment, not negatively, but like you get what I'm saying? Like houses up there are built a little bit differently because there's no fireplaces in houses in Florida. Why do you need that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But you go to this other company, you got a fireplace. Like, you know, we, we appreciate the fireplace, but we don't actually use fireplaces here. But let's show you how we actually do our heating in this particular set. If that makes sense, let me know. I feel like I, I, feel like I did a pretty good job there, but I feel like I did not. So imposter syndrome, I'm just joking. But, um... And that's what I mean by like you can't have the fully house built because like there's going to be a, a particular set of skills that you're going to have to learn at a new place. You know, they're going to just new processes in place. There's new management, there's new people, there's new ways of collaborating, there's new ways to deliver assets to stakeholders, there's new ways to deliver assets to, 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 to devs and all the different things. You know, it's, so, it's similar, but sometimes there's some nuances there that are a little bit different. And so... When you go to, you know, ask those questions in your job and it makes sure you ask those particular questions too. It's like, hey, how do you like to receive your work? Or how do you take, you know, criticism? Or how do you give direction? How do you receive direction? Just like you want to kind of know what type of environment that is and how people take, you know, different, different, different direction, different things, because it could be totally different from what you're used to. And if you, and if you, you can probably come in and maybe disrupt this a little bit, but you don't want to disrupt the whole process where people are like, ah, uh, this is confusing. I don't think we should be doing this. And so, um, yeah, this is going to be like a, probably a short little podcast, but like, you know, how to stay motivated as a UX designer, man. Like I would just say, just keep doing what you're doing. Make sure that you're reading books, like for real, read books. Listen, I read that's audio books or like your Kindles or whatever, physical books or whatever and gain knowledge in that way. And don't always rely on individuals to provide you with that motivation as well, because sometimes you need to be a self-starter in that sense. I know a lot of us are, but some of us <laughs> need a little bit more hand-holding than others, right? So being able to stay motivated, I would just say, one, you know, learn as much as you can, you know, get some confidence within, your, within yourself, and you're like, well, Eric, what if I'm not actually working? Like, how do I stay motivated in that way? Like, well, what if I what if I did my boot camp and you know haven't gotten a job yet? Like, what how can I stay motivated in that sense? I'll say it depends. Like everything in user experience, it depends on you, it depends on your environment or your location and your skill set. And so I would say for me, it's just like just keep practicing, keep working on it. Don't stop working on it. Just don't stop working on it. And, you know, also work on the things you're good at. Get better at those. But also work on the things you're not so good at. And get great at those. You know, if you're really bad at visual design, maybe you should, like, read some books on design fundamentals and actually get into the program and start working on those things. If you're not good at the user research, 
Maybe you should like go out and observe. Maybe you should go out and talk to people, interview people, make up a project that you actually want to, you know, learn more about or just get into the habit of just talking to people and get in the habit of just interviewing people. You know, for me, like I'm not that great at um, public speaking. You know, sometimes I would get nervous, but I do the podcast that helps me articulate, talk very fastly, quickly, keeps me up to keep you up to speed and be able to talk in front of people. That helps me out a lot. Also have a sales background. So that kind of probably helps a lot too, actually. Let me think about that. Yeah, it does. And <laughs> and so uh, just stay motivated, man. Just like try not to get bogged down. And also get outside, man. Take your butts outside. Like you don't have to be around people, but like take your butts outside, man. It's It's sunny. It's really sunny right now. I'm trying to cut this podcast early so I can go walk my dogs for an hour. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got to stay motivated, man. I feel like you have to do other things besides the thing that you're trying to do. I know, I know I'm like all over the place, but let me just break it down into a few things. So stay motivated, you know, learn as much as you can, right? Practice, and then go out and get a damn hobby. That's what's going to keep you sane and motivated. Because, and also be willing to step back and step away. From things. That's why I say go get that hobby. Because if you're constantly in it and thick of it and in it all the time, you're not able to see around you. Right? You gotta get out of the you gotta get out of the sea, get onto the beach, lay out and go get that tan. Because I can't be treading water all day because you tread water all day, what's gonna happen? You're gonna get tired. Man, these analogies, these things are sucking right now, but I don't care. I'm trying to get out. I'm trying to go outside. <laughs> but, um, yeah, man, staying motivated, I think it's a tough subject to talk about in one sense because it depends on the particular person. I mean, I could tell you how to stay motivated from my point of view, but it might not work for you. It might not particularly work for you because you are a different person. You have different needs. You got to, you know, you got to know your audience and your audience is you. Like, you know what makes you the most happy. You know what gets you down. You know what keeps you motivated at night or in the day. You know what gets you going. So to keep yourself going, man, like, do that. Sometimes you don't have to listen to, to motivational speeches from other people. Like, I don't listen to motivational speakers. I, I mean, why? Because their motivation is not my motivation. They can say all the pretty words they want. Like, go out there, kick butt, lace up your bootstraps, all this other jazz and all these adages and action verbs and action words and shit. But what is that doing for you when you actually leave the thing? Like, what? how actionable is go out there and pull up your bootstraps? In, a, in an actual context, if I were to hear that and say, let's say I apply that, that methodology of actually going out there in my closet grabbing my boots, pulling my bootstraps up. They're actually called shoestrings, bootstrings, or whatever the fuck. And I do that. How is that helping me? Let's be literal. What, what actionable item in that is going to help me? It's all hoobla. It's snake oil. Don't, don't believe in that. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps? What does that even mean, guys? What does that mean? That lingo makes no sense because if you're going to listen to somebody, you need to listen for actionable items, things that you can actually go and do. Literally, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Like you're a UX designer, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Bruh, that makes no sense. What can I do? Well, you can go out, you can download Figma. It's free. You can start working on your visual design. You can go read books. You can go out and get learn the laws of UX, knowing Gestalt's principles, know, know your heuristic principles, know all those different things about user experience, you know, affinity mapping, you know, information architecture. Learn those things. Go to LinkedIn Learning. Go to Skillshare. Go to, go, to, go to Ugly Unicorns. I don't care where you go. Go learn these different things and then apply those things in practice. Read it, then apply it. Read it, then apply it. Read it, then apply it. It's just like we'll be doing, it's like we'll be doing UX. Design, iterate, test, go. That's what we do. That's what we do. 
<laughs> we build it, we test it. We build it, we test it. You read it, you go apply it. You read it, you go apply it. That's all you got to do. Even if your projects suck, it does not matter. Just do a project. It doesn't have to be this whole thought-provoking thing. It doesn't have to actually solve the world's problems. It doesn't have to do any of that stuff. But you need to apply something. If you're bad at interviewing, go out and interview people. Please. That's what you need to get better at. If you're bad at public speaking, do a freaking Toastmasters, a podcast, or a Zoom call, or whatever to get yourself comfortable with talking with people. If you're bad at design and you want to do graphic design, whatever, download some Photoshop, go learn some particular set of skills, and then make you a poster. It's, it's simple, guys. It's so simple, it, but we make it difficult. We think that we have to, you know, gain all this knowledge first and, and, and then do nothing with it. I'm guilty of this too. Like how many times have I, you know, watched particular videos and didn't apply anything that the person was talking about? Didn't apply anything. And how many times have you bought a course and you didn't apply anything in that course? What are we doing? So that's what I'm saying. Like when you learn something, you need to go out and apply that thing and you need to keep practicing and practicing and practicing and practicing. And it is not, all about visuals. It's not about the UI. I'm not saying only practice the UI and developing apps. Do everything but that. Okay? To everybody out there who's doing user experience, user experience, and you have you have a problem. You have a problem that you want to solve. Do everything that you need to do to solve that problem except designing UIs. And see how far you get. Because in that sense, you are now forced to do actual user experience. You need to do everything but that part. Because that's the part that people don't see. People think user experience is the UI design, the, the visual stuff, the, the, the app mockups, etc. Okay, great. Everything I just said just now, don't do any of that. Do everything but that. So define that problem. Trying to solve that problem. Hypothesis, problem statements, user testing, all that shit. Do all that and then some. Designing the right thing, designing things right. Do the part where you are designing right things. That is the discover and define part. I'm looking at my design thinking and research right here. It says discover, define, design, deliver. Do discover and define. Don't even worry about design because that's the easy stuff. <laughs> that's what people don't understand. Designing is the easy part for some. For, you have no idea. That's the part I can find 100 people to do. But discover and define, that's, that's the difficult part. So we have here we have initial hypothesis, current journeys, research insights, uh, user pain points. You got to figure those out. Here we go. Problem statement, goals and objectives, refine hypothesis, research and pain points again, opportunities, etc. Do those things. Right? Do those things first. And then you can worry about the UI design. And that's the one tangent um, I do not want to get on at the moment is the user experience slash user interface design. If you, t if you were to, you know, say what those are and then add your slash, the role would make no sense. And, uh, and you guys know what I mean? When you see a role that says UX slash UI designer, okay, that's two different roles, not the same thing. A UI, is a, UI design is a subset of user experience. So let's say you say, let's say you read this job posting like this. User experience designer slash user interface designer. What would you think then? What would you think this job would be about? You would think this person made a mistake. And they put two jobs in one, right? Anyways, I'm going to end this podcast, man. It's a little short one. But um, look out for me doing... Uh, uh, I'm going to talk to you about my, my job interview process whiteboard challenges, what I did to get a job, 
how many jobs I applied for, how many rejections I got, interviews. Look out for those particular videos because those are things that are going to be something that are important for you guys to help you guys out. And also the type of interview questions that I ask uh, interview interviewers um, to help me get a kind of a obed on you know their the the company their culture where they where they are you know are they a growing company are they a stagnant company you know how how do people manage how do people you know what's their UX maturity that's a big one I always ask because I want to see like does UX really really take part in their business or just you know, a user experience just there because they want to add pretty colors to a user interface. So those are some particular questions that I ask in every interview. I'm going to probably do a video on that and then make probably a PDF that I can give you guys. And also my, and also I'm probably going to give out my, my framework for my, my, um, my, my, my whiteboard challenges and what I did for that and how, what I used to, to pass that. And I'll show you guys that. And then um, basically Show you guys how to do like an Excel spreadsheet of like your jobs and everything, how to keep track of all that stuff and probably do something like that for you guys too. So be on the lookout for that. And also, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to end it right there. This podcast has been longer than it should be. I'm going to go walk my dogs. And I uh, appreciate you guys for, uh, for listening, for, uh, for hanging in there with me. I know it's been a while since I've, so I posted one of these things. I'm a little rusty now, as you can tell. I'm not as smooth as I usually am. I'm not as smooth, bruh. I'm not as smooth as I used to be. Yeah, I'm still singing, bruh. That contract's coming So, <laughs> Anyways, guys, I appreciate you rocking with me today. Uh, this is Eric Abram. And um, don't forget um, to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, to the YouTube channel if you're watching it from here. And if you are listening on the audio podcast, I do appreciate you from listening there. But make sure you rate it five stars. And um, like I always say, guys, don't just be a unicorn. Be an ugly unicorn. Peace.